So good evening, everyone. My name is Kristen Moran, and I'm really pleased to be with you tonight as both a Union League member and the Director of Development for the Legacy Foundation. It's a pleasure to welcome you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, thank you, to tonight's Civil War Roundtable, and to also welcome all of those who are on Zoom with us. On behalf of my colleague, Jim Mundy, who could not be with us tonight, I thank you for attending and also for your support of the Legacy Foundation, which, as many of you know, is the charitable arm of the Union League of Philadelphia. And the work that we do um, on behalf of all of our members is to preserve and share our Union League values um, to help create citizen leaders that do support the Constitution. So thank each and every one of you for that. You have likely noted one of our recent projects when you entered the building tonight. So there is an incredible portrait of Frederick Douglass downstairs that is literally stopping members and guests in its tracks. Um, and that was made possible by the voluntary contributions of our members. Um, many of you are here tonight and we thank you for that. Um, the portrait has garnered a lot of press in the last week or so. We were in Newsweek, we were on CBS3, the Philadelphia Tribune, and the blog Broad and Liberty, if you haven't seen that. So spread the word about that wonderful portrait. It will be on display to the public from October 8th to the 15th. So anyone um, can come during that period and see it. It will be down in the Heritage Center. And then it will have a permanent home in the Broad Street hallway just outside of the Business Center. So we are all very excited about that portrait. So now on to tonight's Civil War Roundtable. There is a remarkable yet barely recognized Civil War painting in the League's collection titled Harvest Home When the War is Over. It can be seen in the, in the main hallway of the Broad Street building. It was painted by Philadelphia artist, Joseph John. So it is in fact a Philadelphia painting. On its large canvas can be seen the different scenarios of Civil War veterans and their families after the war. There is the expected grief of families when the soldier did not return home and the unexpected joy when they did. Tonight's program features local journalist and author, Jim Remsen, whose story about camp discharge could almost have been taken from that painting. Located in Lower Marion Township, the camp was created to handle the thousands of soldiers who survived the war, only to be repatriated back into society and family life. It has been long forgotten, but Jim's story of the camp and its soldiers, much like our very own painting, reminds us that perhaps the greatest casualties of war are in fact its survivors. So it is my great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Jim Remsen. Mr. Remsen is a journalist and the author of four books, The Inner Marriage Handbook, Visions of Tigua, Tigua, am I saying, Tioga, thank you, Embattled Freedom, and his latest book, which was just published this August, Back from Battle. Since retiring as the religion editor at the Philadelphia Inquirer, Jim has pursued his keen interest in history with a focus on the underappreciated aspects of our nation's local histories. Being a native of Northeastern Pennsylvania, he was pleased to be bringing that region's Indian settler history to light and then to share the remarkable black and abolitionist story of his hometown, Waverly, which is near Scranton. In his newest book, Back from Battle, he turns to a forgotten story just up the Schuylkill River from where we are tonight in his current town of uh, Ballackinwood. So please help me welcome Jim Ramson. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, folks. Yeah, what a, what a great crowd. And you on Zoom, uh, welcome as well. Uh, it's an honor and a thrill to be back here. I gave a talk four years ago for the uh, Embattled Freedom book, and this is such an august institution that has all this great Civil War history of your own that you can be really proud of. Um, so I, it's wonderful to be back. And I'm going to be bringing you some lost history um, back that uh, I sure didn't know about. And I get a sense from even chatting with a few of you it's news to you too. Um, I live in Ballackinwood at the Lower Marion Historical Society, which is you know in my my town. Uh, asked if I would be willing to jump in and 
help them research and write up the story of camp discharge. They knew about it, uh, but wanted to you know dig deeper into it. And um, that's what we have been able to do here. So there you're seeing a, a picture of camp discharge. Uh, it's a picture taken probably in 1865 during the few months that it even existed. It was only up, uh, was erected in 1864 and dismantled and sold off in uh, early 1866. So it was kind of a, a pop-up camp that uh, was um, ordered, erected very, very quickly. And when its use was done, it was dismantled. But it, it um, was involved in a very interesting era of the war and of the immediate peace after the war that I'll, I'll be talking about. Um, so this picture was taken from the east side of the Schuylkill River in what today would call Mequon above Maniunk as you're continuing up out of the city. Uh, and it's looking across the river and you can see dimly at the top and I realize all this is dim. Be patient because we have a, uh, a detailed picture later on that shows you some of what you're looking at, but it's a lovely composition. But there, almost like a mirage at the top of the hill, is camp, the buildings of Camp Discharge. Uh, and you see a few houses there. There was a railroad line, the Reading Railroad, that ran up that west bank of the Schuylkill and uh, had a, a stop right at Camp Discharge. And that was critical to the camp's location and its, its purpose. Um, so I will be taking you through and you'll be seeing more of that. But this is a lovely image, but it was a grim place, as I want to tell you about uh, as well. So where exactly was it? So here's more of a, a detailed map for you. This is modern um, um, you know, locations and, and uh, institutions there. You can see the Schuylkill Expressway 76 going up paralleling uh, the Schuylkill River. And you see over on the far left here, the uh, Philadelphia Country Club golf course. And then Camp Discharge going from the bluff, which is now um, part of the golf course, heading down toward the river. And so the, the railroad bed would have been more or less where the roadbed of the Schuylkill is now. And the railroad tracks are now out closer to the river. Back then it was flipped and there was a road that was out closer to the river. In any case, that is the camp. It was 56 acres that the army rented from a farmer um, when the order was made to uh, erect this camp. So it, you see the mile markers there. Just try to keep in your mind mile 334. And it, next time you're heading up or down the expressway, you know, all the every tenth of a mile, um, you'll see a marker. And that, that'll just give you an idea. There's no signage otherwise. We're hoping to get that. That hopefully will be one of the outgrowths of this, not along the expressway, but up in the local roads. Um, so yeah, it's almost when you're all the way to the big Conshohocken curve, just to give you your bearings. So that was uh, where it was. And to understand why it was there, you need to understand a little bit of when it was built. And what I mean is it was built in mid 1864. So go back three years earlier, 1861, the war breaks out. There's a great rush of volunteers joining the army. Pennsylvania had over 300,000 good men who um, enlisted. Uh, many of them in 61 for three year terms. So do your math. You've come to the end of those terms. These men by and large want out and they're holding the, the army to that promise. They had a contract. They gave their pound of flesh. Many of them you know, went through hell and then some and they wanted out and their families wanted them out. And uh, meanwhile, more regiments were being recruited, but these three-year men wanted out. That was what the order to build the camp particularly specified, to get these three-year men out. So this is an 1861 poster just showing, you know, the great enthusiasm uh, at, at the time. Um, and this is one of the Philly regiments. And so these three-year men had gone through hell and back. They had been in um, all of the battles that you know about. This is an image of the furious fight at the Bloody Angle in, in Gettysburg. And the, the Philadelphia Brigade was right there at the Bloody Angle. 
in this pitch fighting, but the, the men who, uh, Pennsylvania volunteers who went to Camp Discharge had been in all, all the battles you can imagine, Antietam, Fredericksburg, um, Petersburg, Gettysburg, the Atlanta campaign, you name it. And they had um, lived through all that, seen many of their colleagues die uh, over the years, and they wanted uh, out. Some of them, you know, would, would re-up, but most of them had volunteered with no intention of becoming professional soldiers. They were doing their duty. Um, so this image really gives you an idea of what it was really like for these men in the mayhem of battle. You might march off into battle in flanks and as a you know, cohesive regiment. And then boom, in battle, all kinds of things happen. And men are getting split off from their regiments. Okay, They are being wounded uh, and felled in, in battle and taken off the battlefield and taken somewhere to recuperate. Uh, some of them may have been sick even before and weren't even able to go into the battle. but. Some would go into battle and be captured, often in groups. They would be surrounded and captured and sent off to a prison camp somewhere down south. Uh, many, many in Andersonville. You probably all know about Andersonville. Um, heavy representation of Andersonville survivors at Camp Discharge. Um, and so you might have marched off to war as a cohesive unit, but the, the fury of battle just destroys a lot of that cohesion. And you have fragments of, of your colleagues who were not with you anymore. They had been left behind because of injury, wound, capture. Sometimes they would be reassigned to another regiment where they needed uh, some men to be teamsters or they needed men to be sharpshooters or something that you would be reassigned. But uh, you always needed to muster out with the same regiment you mustered in with. So even though you might have at the end of the war been attached to another regiment, you needed to get your paperwork and go through a process that the army set out for you to be mustered out methodically. And Camp Discharge played a role in, in that by um, gathering up the men who were not able to muster out methodically with the rest of their regiment because of this scattering. You know, these, these, these guys were, were like the remnants. Sometimes they would arrive at Camp Discharge all alone. Other times they'd come with a little a cohort of their, their colleagues and they, who had managed to stay together in capture and then make their way back north. But many of them came alone. We have a whole roster of the men who were there and you would have a regiment that would have three men who had made it to Camp Discharge, another regiment would have two men, one would have four, one would have one single man. So these are the, the um, stragglers and the, you know, the, the men who were kind of castaways from, for one circumstance or another. Um, like take that man with his arm in a sling there, uh, right in the middle. He, um, you know, he might have, uh, uh, gotten wounded and gotten an infection, gone to um, a hospital, had lost his arm. Um, by the time he got to camp discharge, you know, been in, in death's door. So just to give you an idea of uh, how things would play out. Um, so these men were funneled up to camp discharge, these fragments of regiments, because the, let me say the the mass of the regiment might have been methodically mustered out already. And it might have happened in Northern Virginia or Washington DC or Philadelphia sometimes and gone off and you know been discharged and gone back to their, their lives. These guys might show up a month later having no idea you know, where, where their colleagues, their comrades were um, and not even knowing where their paperwork was. So they would be funneled up to camp discharge and they would have to wait there while the adjutant's office would send couriers out and retrieve the paperwork from the regiments where these men had been to vouch for their identity, find out if they were owed pay, if they were deserters, you, then you would you know, find that out about them. Um, but uh, you would um, reconcile their paperwork. So these men would have to sit at camp while this process was going on. That's what the, the specialty purpose of camp discharge was. Um, so 
this is one of the finds that we had. Nobody had really researched camp discharge, and there are other camps that could be ready to be researched, folks, if you uh, like to do some research. But down to the National Archives in DC, we were able to track down the uh, site plan for camp discharge done by the architect who, who the um, army had hired to, to go and uh, develop that. Um, there you see the Schuylkill on the bottom, woods in the middle. This dark line across the middle is simply from the fold of the cloth. It was like on a canvas cloth. And then the, the, base, the, the heart of the camp is up top um, where you see there's some uh, barracks buildings in like a U shape and then administrative buildings at the top, supply buildings, and a big parade, a parade ground in the middle. Um, and so it was uh, wonderful to be able to find that. And it, it tracks the way the camp itself looks. So this is that detail, that enhanced detail that I was mentioning that I would show you. So here you see all those woods are within the perimeter of the camp. You can see some of the perimeter fence. It was surrounded by a 12 foot high, uh, wooden stockade fence all the way around it, about a you know quarter mile square, and there you can make out the the barracks buildings going across, and then they go up the hill as well. Right in pretty much dead center is this enormous flagpole that was a landmark flagpole that they had brought up from a sanitary fair that was held at Logan Circle a few months earlier, and the army arranged to get that and brought it up, and there stood at the hilltop. Um, and down in the very bottom, there it is, I'm sorry, I was hitting the wrong button to get this. This was a little pre-existing settler farmhouse, still there, the ruins of it are still there, where the commandant of the camp um, lived and he actually brought his family to live there. Um, and uh, so this is Camp Discharge, it really existed. It's the only photo of the place uh, known to exist. But it, it, again, it had this really interesting role in the last stages of the war and the demobilizing of the army. Um, so, as I mentioned, prisoners of war, uh, four in 10 of the, of the men at Camp Discharge had been held by con as Confederate prisoners for various lengths of time. Three in 10 had been at Andersonville, this hellhole of a prison in Southern Georgia, where they had, you know, seen many comrades die, somewhere around 14,000 men had died at, at, while at Andersonville, uh, and they were able to straggle their way north. So uh, in total, by our reckoning, looking over the roster sheets, there were 1,119 men who went to camp discharge for this purpose of being discharged. Uh, and in addition, there were over 600 guards you know, who were there as garrison guards, not all at once, they cycled through um, different companies of men there. But the important number here is uh, 1100 who were this straggler, you know, category who were again funneled up there. So they would go to report to the uh, discharge office, it was at 11th and Spruce, and surrender whatever paperwork they had, um, give their, you know, identity, be given a pass to take the train out to camp discharge, and be assigned to barracks and sit while the staff at the adjutant's office would send out these couriers to as quickly as they could uh, reconcile their paperwork. And then officers would come out on the train, go to the camp with their, their um, discharge paper, their honorable discharge certificate and any pay they were owed. And they would figure out if the man wanted to buy his weapon, you know, what supplies he was owed to go. Uh, the Pennsylvania, um, the state of Pennsylvania paid a railroad pass for the men then to get home. Some of them were from quite close. There were uh, 89 regiments represented at Camp Discharge. Again, some just had one or two men from that regiment, but 89 of them. And 60 of them, 59 of them were Philadelphia regiments. So many of these men were close to home by the time they got up here. And they simply had to wait. You know, imagine they were like five miles from home. They had to spend a month or so at, at camp. Well, it would take longer than a month in some cases for the paperwork to get retrieved because, you know, we didn't have email or text or any of that. You might not even know where your commanding officer was and where the paperwork would be. And, you know, if your regiment had already been mustered out, 
it was complicated. And so these men had to, had to just wait it out. It's the kind of thing we don't think about. You know, we're, we hear the glory. This is the kind of messy aftermath and the sort of mop up that had to happen and it happened at Camp Discharge. So, so again, this is a picture from inside Andersonville itself um, as the men who were able to come and get some uh, meals at the gate. Um, many others were too sick to even uh, assemble there. Uh, this picture of this poor man on, on the right, his name is Philip Hattel. And he is a worst case scenario of a, one of the Andersonville men. The, you, know, you can see how emaciated and sick he was. He was able to make it far enough north to Annapolis. It was a place called Camp Parole. You know, some of these camps did not have very sexy names. Camp Discharge, Camp Parole. There was a camp called Camp Distribution. Um, camp Parole. Uh, where they kept paroled prisoners for a while, but also at a hospital. And it, was, it did its best to stabilize the cases of some of these uh, Andersonville men if they were still alive and made it that far north. Philip Haddle um, died at Camp Parole. Uh, he was from White Marsh. He was a local man, a German immigrant. Left his family behind. Yeah, it's... Very sad. So he did not go to the camp, but I just wanted to put him in there as a, you know, as a local victim of Andersonville who uh, uh, give you an idea of what these men had, had gone through if they had been at Andersonville for a long time. Some blessedly were only there for a month or two, might have lost 15 pounds and not 100 pounds like some of the men had. Um, so more and more prisoners were just uh, piling in to camp discharge as the, as the months went on into the winter of 64, 65, and into the spring. And in late winter, exchanges resumed between the North and South prison, prisoner exchanges. So then the, the floodgates really opened up and more were released. They would straggle their way out to uh, the ships that would be in the coast of North Carolina, South Carolina, and float them up to Annapolis and hopefully stabilize them there. And there are a lot of, we have in the book, a lot of stories of what that trip would, would be like, how traumatized they were. And so Camp Discharge had two infirmary buildings, they call them hospitals, I think of them more as an infirmary, two facing each other on the up, upper end of the camp. Um, and there was a, a doctor, um, had a small medical staff, but the, the doctor, young doctor, who was able to do probably most of the work, a guy named Joseph Corson. You may know that Corson name, old Quaker family. They were at Plymouth meeting and a family of doctors. I was able to get this Joseph Corson's uh, memoir from Ann Corson, the, the latest iteration of a Corson doctor, Dr. Ann Corson. Uh, so they've had doctors every generation for 150 years or so. Um, he talked about uh, at the camp um, hospital, there, he would treat a collection of, and this is a quote, collection of broken down men who required a great deal of work. And so we had hundreds of men. In, I was able to locate the hospital register down at the National Archives in DC of Camp Discharge Hospital, and not only get their names and be able to track them, but also um, how they were treated and I have all these images. If there are any medical people who would like to see that, there's more work to be done in analyzing that. But you get an idea of, um, here, here's a page of uh, that was called the prescription book. And there's a facing page. And this I just have sort of as an example. But there's, there's um, Joseph Corson. And um, this gives you s s examples of what was being done. So it was, in, in a word, it was like they were either overtreated or undertreated by our medical standards today. They'd be given ineffective treatment um, that wouldn't really help them, uh, or they'd be overtreated with uh, mercury, with morphine, with opium. Some of them came out addicts. Um, some of these er, these old methods that um, were would be bleeding people or trying to drain the liquids out of them in order to cleanse noxious what were called noxious ingredients from them. In the U.S., they still had this idea of miasmatic diseases that bad air would be what would cause infections, and the germ theory that had started to take root in Europe had not yet come over and taken taken root in the US, which was the, you know, there were infections you could treat with 
medicines and antibiotics. Um, so there was the old world treatments for them that were um, sometimes causing men to avoid going to the hospital. A lot of them went as outpatients because they didn't want to stay in the hospital because the hospitals were dangerous places where the worst cases were. I ha we have in the book some of the um, diseases that the men had there. Uh, and in fact, that probably goes to explain why Camp Discharge was in this odd location on a hillside in the middle of nowhere at the time. It was farmland, surrounded by farmland, very lightly settled for the sake of the general public because of the fear of contagion. Smallpox was running rampant. There was cholera, there, were, there was malaria, a lot of diseases being brought up by these soldiers, camp diseases and other, other um, ailments. So the, the public was afraid of, of that, of course. Um, and so that might've been uh, why this camp was placed up there. I didn't find dead on certainty of that, but based on what was happening elsewhere in the North, um, I, there's a good chance that was why it was placed in this location. Oh, and, and the man, the soldier on the, on the bottom there, a drummer boy, and when he, he was 14 when he enlisted, by a few years later, he was in the, in the unit as a, as a private. He got a VD, venereal disease, as a young man, and that was another reason they wanted to not have the camp be right in the middle of population centers. Is they didn't want to have the temptations of bars and liquor and prostitutes who would hang around camps. He, but they did, uh, and particularly a number of the guards. He was in a guard unit and he ended up getting VD as, a, as just a teenager, excuse me. Um, so there you go. And uh, we have in that too, how they treated uh, VD with mercury, just bombing people with mercury. There was this expression I'd never heard, but it captures it. Um, a nighttime with Venus, a lifetime with Mercury. And yeah, it makes you laugh, but these, these men uh, would have a lot of health, uh, health problems from that, from that Mercury. Um, so the commandant of the camp was this man in the bottom. This is a picture taken years later, and his name was John Hancock. How about that for a name? He was the kid brother of Winfield Scott Hancock. John Hancock himself had proven himself brave in battle, so he wasn't just riding in on his brother's coattails, but he did request this duty, and his brother said, yeah, it sounds like a good idea, and guess what? He got that duty, so he was the commandant of the camp. We have in there some uh, friction that he caused by he wanted desperately to have a, a camp with the esprit de corps and like a normal camp, and uh, he would have uh, he's an arrangement to have Sunday dress parade, and he had a special train for people to come up and you know enjoy this. People didn't come. They canceled the train. I don't think he had much of real dress parades because uh, probably the guards could do it, but a lot of the men were in no shape to do it, and they didn't have their uniforms and, and equipment. Anyways, he managed to get these some fancy, these are called Napoleons, these brass cannons. Uh, up there as well. And he had a band room and a band. He hired a band that wasn't even military. It was just local musicians to come in. So he, he, he did that. And he w desperately wanted to grade, flatten the parade ground. It was on a slope, remember? Uh, and a very up and down slope too. And he had horses come and carts and he would hire local workers and the army pushed back on that. He tried to get the soldiers to do it. And he never, it seems like he never really got it done. So that's like a odd kind of subplot is what John Hancock was all about. Um, so meanwhile, you know, he's trying to do dress parades and a lot of the men were tired of, last place they wanted to be was the camp discharge. It was an expression, it was a grumbler's paradise, an expression of the day. They had a lot of dead time. They would get little make work duty during the day. They would have to show up for a morning um, roll call, but then they, it wasn't much to do. Um, so they would play cards, carouse. These are not pictures from Camp Discharge, but just to give you an idea. They were, there was AWOL, uh, men going AWOL, um, reports of that for sure. They would get night passes, you know, to go and they would go to Norristown and Conshohocken and Spring Mill, there were taverns and there's stories about, you know, having to send the guards out to scoop the men up and bring them back. 
um, but some were not coming back and they were going AWOL, not like long-term, you'll never see me again, but they'd wanna go back to visit their family in Philly. They would just stay out longer than they should and they'd get thrown in the guardhouse. That's a guardhouse up there. And there was a guardhouse uh, on the map um, and they were throwing men in the guardhouse. Uh, and, and it seems eventually he got a control, got on top of the discipline problem. Um, but yeah, it was not a happy place. And the men, like, again, they'd gone through three years of war and they just wanted out. Um, this is one of the many, we had like uh, 40 of these sheets that Brad, my co-author and research partner and I went through of deciphering, these are the soldiers when they were, uh, signed in, you know, there would be a clerk up at the uh, camp headquarters. And when they came in, uh, what their um, company was, what the regiment was, what their name was. Um, and you can imagine it was all cursive writing. Somebody might be German and it'd say his name and the guy wouldn't understand how to spell it. And then the next month it would be spelled right. And so we, we had some deciphering to do, there were some challenges. Um, but you can see also just the volume of it. There was a lot of that. Um, it all turned into a roster that we have. Half of the book is a roster of the men, just to bring them their tribute, but also for use of other counties because they came from all up and down Eastern PA. I did not mention, but this camp was attached to the Eastern jurisdiction of Pennsylvania, the army jurisdiction. What that meant is if you had been mustered in from a camp in the eastern part of the state, this is where you needed to muster out through this process. Not the west, but the east. Um, and so if you were mustered in in Philly, if you were mustered in in Westchester, uh, Reading, uh, Pottsville, Wilkes-Barre, uh, Lancaster, you needed to go to camp discharge. So we were able to you know, puzzle all that out. Some of the men were some companies of men were blended in from Western PA, which complicated the picture, but by and large, they were mustered in, in the Eastern part of the US. This, on the bottom, I have a little bit of a detail here. And so number four and five, a, a man named, you may not be able to read it, but a, a, again, it's cursive, a guy named Swisher and a guy named E-Golf, like golf with an E in the beginning, E-Golf. They, they, again, Andersonville men stuck together and lived together after the war as well. And I'll, I'll get back to, just keep those names in mind, Swisher and E-Golf later. Um, so as I mentioned, the prisoner exchanges resumed and soldiers were emptied out of the prisons down south and made their way up. This is one of the, the naval vessels that were carrying horribly ill soldiers up from might have been Wilmington, North Carolina, or Florence, um, South Carolina, and up north, uh, generally up to Camp Parole. But um, they might have some of them come directly into Philly. I, we don't actually know case by case. But you can see what a miserable place that could that would have been. These were men in, you know, in the prime of life. These were not us guys. These were guys who were, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21. Uh, and they look like they could be me. <laughs> they, you know, they, they've gone through so much and they're in, packed in there in close quarters. And just to give you an idea of the shape they were in. So it's really tragic. Um, and meanwhile, you know, there was this crush of new arrivals and a public pressure to get these guys home. You know, these are our, our sons. We need them in the field or we need them to go back and work in the factory, you know, to bring us um you know bring us some money um so there was there was pressure uh from both ends and and of course the army wanted to uh, certainly when the war was over to demobilize and save you know their huge outlays of money so uh, it, it continued doing its thing through the summer months of 65 again the war was over in april but it, you know there was obviously a delay more people pumping north and being funneled there and all that whole process of the paperwork reconciliation and you know trying to be methodical about that while also the high command was saying downsize downsize you know justify yourself or close and there was thought should the camp be closed or stay open for a while well you could argue either way but they needed to keep it open for a while because of the processing that they were doing 
but then they need to close it as soon as possible just to save the money. Um, there was an inspection done uh, around this time in the fall of 65, right? And this was the quartermaster, you can see uh, September 65. And he said, what the heck was this place doing up there? You can see at the end, I'm at a loss to conceive how anybody in his right senses could have selected this site. So <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, you'll, you'll read more about some of the, the uh, challenges of, this, of that site. Uh, in there. It could have been, I mean, moving it out of the city was one thing uh, that made sense, but there were flatter areas so they could have could have done it along there. Uh, but maybe somebody knew somebody who knew somebody and got them a deal. We don't know. It's not in the record. Uh, but this just is pretty striking at the end. It was kind of a slap in the face to the commandant uh, from the quartermaster. So uh, end of 65, uh, ordered closed, mothballed, um, inventoried, big list, this ran in the Philly papers, auction gonna happen, come if you wanna buy any part of it. And you can see it's awesomely long and it's got, you know, 116,000 feet of flooring boards, et cetera, 286,000 feet of rough boards, um, 39 frame buildings uh, and a sentry box and a flag staff. You see the picture on the right, that is an image of a mill in Conchahokan called the Balagomingo Mills. And the Balagomingo operator, uh, owner, purchased the flagstaff and the, and the flagpole. And there it is, uh, after the war. It, it turned out it burned down uh, some in the mid 1870s, but it proudly was moved and, and flew above the Balagomingo Mills. The sentry box is an interesting story too, and I'll mention more about that in a minute. But it, there was an auction held in early January of 66. People had to come get their stuff, haul it away, and uh, the land reverted to um, the prior owner and uh, to being farmland and pasture land. Um, so I wanna just talk a little bit about the soldiers. A big part of what we did in the book is not just tell you the administrative history of, that camp, of the camp. It's kind of interesting and peculiar that it was up there and you know all of that, but what, were the, what are the men gone through to get there? What was their experience in the war? Who were they? What was their experience in the war? And um, what was the rest of their life like? You know, to really bring the story uh, alive. And so we, we profile 15, 16 of the men in some depth uh, toward the end of the book. And this is just two of them I wanna uh, tell you about a little bit. And again, here's this Hayes Swisher who I mentioned was in that the cursive list before. And this man, Albert Thalheimer. Albert Thalheimer, a German Jew, immigrated to Philadelphia to get away from the horrible anti-Semitism in the old country you know, with his family. This is him later in life, an obituary picture of him. So he went through Andersonville, says he lost 100 pounds in Andersonville. Managed to stabilize, recover, became an entrepreneur, um, moved to Reading uh, and made, made his fortune in Reading, trying different companies and, and different businesses until he settled on a cigar box factory, manufactured cigar boxes. Uh, and became a member of their Board of Trade, their Chamber of Commerce, um, but was always remembering his comrades. He testified uh, uh, in, in their behalf to you know, increase uh, their uh, pension treatment. Um, he hired veterans to, in his uh, cigar box factory, would you know, make a point of bringing in something like 50 of his uh, for, veterans to help him um, to, to work there. Um, set aside land for a old soldier's home on Mount Penn, in, um, which is in Reading, and, and died a very, you know, highly regarded, civic-minded man. Hayes, um, I want to read you a little bit about Hayes, um, just one story that uh, is pretty powerful. So if you'll Bear with me. A -E -E, Edward Hayes Swisher was part of the surge of Andersonville survivors who made it to Camp Discharge in May 1865, many of them in dire shape. 
a tailor by training, Swisher had signed up for the proud 7th PA Reserves back in October 1861. He was 24 at the time, slight in stature, only five foot four and 140 pounds. And that looks like he's about that age there. His regiment was federalized to become the 36th Pennsylvania Volunteer Infantry. Swisher was mustered as a corporal in Company H, a contingent of men from Cumberland County. Again, the camp served all the counties uh, in the eastern end of the, of the state. They saw more than their share of combat. Swisher was shot in the left calf at Charles City Crossroads, Virginia in June, 1862. The mini ball lodged in his leg. A sergeant in his company recalled years later, he refused to leave the battle line as he might've done, but being a brave soldier and full of grit, he would stand at his post as long as he was able, although the blood was flowing from his wound in a stream, and he did fight on and until night closed the battle." End quote. Later that year at Antietam, Swisher was shot in the finger, and then in May 1864, he was captured at the Battle of the Wilderness. Many, many of the men at Camp Discharge were captured. There was a mass capture at the Wilderness. Um, Hellish imprisonment followed until he was freed in April 1865, afflicted with scurvy and rheumatism. He left camp discharge for home, found work first as a laborer and then as a railroad watchman. In the mid 1870s, he moved to the oil region of Northwestern Pennsylvania to try his luck there. That's where he first applied for an invalid pension in 1879. Affidavits in support of his claim described Swisher's tenuous health Joseph Egolf, remember the other man who went through the war and camp discharge with Swisher, told a pension lawyer of their time together at Andersonville. As the lawyer summarized, both Swisher and deponent contracted the bone scurvy, were together in the same bunk and, and suffered greatly from this painful disease, helping each other as best we could in our affliction, they said. Swisher was very bad with the disease and deponent often wondered that he even survived to get through." End quote. A boss at the well site, remember this is a, the oil well site, said Swisher's feet, this is later in life, gave him a great deal of trouble. The flesh seemed not right frequently and he would remove his boots and put his feet in water, end quote. A medical exam in 1890 gave a grim picture, quote, disease of mouth, with loss of teeth, result of scurvy, has no teeth at all in his upper jaw, and his front teeth are, are loose in the lower jaw. Excessive flow of saliva, gums ulcerated at times, he has rheumatism all through his body." End quote. In 1899, he was still toiling in the oil fields as best he could. could. Neighbors attested he was blind in one eye, short of breath, and so broken down and disabled that he could not work over half his time one friend said. The first pension examiner denied his claim, saying that there wasn't enough proof that his disabilities were war related. Swisher kept trying and was eventually ruled 818th disabled. You see that if you look at pension records, they had this whole formula, 818th disabled. That, that got him a paltry monthly stipend of $6 in 1897. It rose to $12 by uh, 1904 when Swisher died. His wife, Mary, got a monthly widow pension of $8 that year. Swisher's struggle with the Pension Bureau led his friend, Joseph Egolf, his old comrade, to write, quote, I think it very strange that we prisoners must have so much trouble to get what is justly due to us. All we ask for is justice before we all quit this hard fight for life. So, that's what we have in there. They really give you an idea of what these the men sacrifice and the pound of flesh and then some that they had given. Um, and I'll briefly just tell you, here's another man too, um, who abandoned his family. Um, and uh, here he is a young man and he moved to, his family by then was in Camden, he went to Ohio. And um, only years later did they learn he had taken up a new life they are just a lot of these men were rootless, you know, psychically just kind of destroyed from the war. Okay, let me uh, round the bend and, and wrap it up here. Um, so what happened to the site? 
This is, you see, if you can read the caption, view from camp discharge porch. Well, the family of the Allen Wood Steel Company, Howard Wood, the, the, the operator at that time, um, purchased this land and built his estate there. And he called it Camp Discharge, just to keep the name alive and honor the name. In the distance where you can see that row of trees, that's where the actual uh, army camp would have been. He had his, um, his home on a knoll, on a, uh, a bluff, uh, like a long <laughs> fairway, golf fairway away a few hundred yards. Uh, and that's the porch. Um, and remember I mentioned that sentry box that still exists. This is a modern picture of the sentry box that uh, used to be at the camp and it is now lovingly tended by people who live near it on a, a little lane called Sentry Lane. That's uh, right near Riverbend Nature Center, if you can picture any of that. Um, and you can see it. Uh, it was purchased by um, someone who then gave it as a gift to the, to the Howard, Howard Wood and he put it at the foot of his driveway and there it is now, uh, pretty remarkable. Um, the picture over here, I just have here briefly for you. Keep in mind, the Lower Marion Historical Society, they really commissioned me and Brad to write this book. Um, they have, are creating and are ready to hit the button on a whole page on their website about Camp Discharge. It has a lot of uh, cool things worth going to, including a searchable roster, but a lot of pictures that are big and colorful. And this map that shows where there's a walking trail if you wish to go there. There is a one walking trail that'll take you to the camp. Um, I won't tell you more about it now, but if you go to the down the bottom, lowermarionhistory.org, you can see this in detail. My co-author and research partner, Brad, is there in a hole. What is he doing? He is six feet down in a refuse pit at the site of Camp Discharge digging up goodies, digging up artifacts, relics of the actual camp that he was able to locate where a latrine was that became a refuse pit and took a chance and dug six feet down. He's a big burly guy and he, he loves it. And there he's holding up a bottle that he had just, just found in the muck. Uh, and this is some of the artifacts that he's found. And there's a display case in the back if you wanna check them out as well. He's lovingly, excavated them, identified them, cleaned them, and it it'll be turned over to the Historical Society. Uh, but this is another part of this story. We're also working to get signage up there. So people who are on the local roads up there will be able to learn about Camp Discharge. And we're going to actually be leading some tours. Uh, the Riverbend Nature Center, which is up there, is having us up to do a walking tour. And um, we'll probably do, we'll be doing it for the country club too, I'm pretty sure. So thus is uh, my, my talk about Camp Discharge. So you, I didn't know anything about it. Uh, you all folks probably didn't know anything about it. It's an amazing chapter at the end of the war that really we know all about the battles, we know about the generals, we know about the campaigns, the politics. We don't really know about that end point and the demobilizing and the hustle bustle to make it happen while the shards of the soldiers are scattered everywhere and trying to deal with it. And Camp Discharge did its part in that, that uh, chapter of our history. And I'm really proud to have brought it out. I have uh, books back there uh, if anybody wants to pick up a copy. Uh, that'd be great. And I'm here to answer questions uh, as well. Yes, sir. Hold on one second. Aha, you're being mic'd. So thank you for the talk. Um, how would a soldier know that he should show up at Camp Discharge? He would have, good question. The best we can tell is he would show up at a camp and when they learned where he had mustered in, they would have gotten word that somebody like that needs to be directed to Philly and Philly has a specialty camp, camp discharge that will deal with him. Because if, if he had been mustered out, if his, the rest of his regiment had been mustered out, that was his only recourse at that point. Now, hopefully it worked methodically. We know that 1,100 of the soldiers learned that. There may have been others where the word never got to them. I don't know, but that was the system anyways. And it worked generally uh, methodically. Yes, sir.
how, how long, how long uh, yes. was this journey for you? Um, you know, it's hard to know exactly when it began, but I'll say two and a half years, maybe three years, three trips to the National Archives down in Washington, Harrisburg State Archives, Carlisle Army Archives, Camp Discharge, Camp Discharge again, Historical Society of Pennsylvania, Norristown to the, um, you know, so just give you an idea that, that, and then drawing from all that and the writing, yeah, two and a half years. So, so there are a number of us here from White Marsh Township and we have a cemetery in our, in the Lutheran church there that has probably 40 or 50 people that served in the Civil War, probably 20 of them died in the Civil War. And uh, part yeah. of our- Died in combat, I mean. Yes, absolutely. Wow. And, and so to find out their stories, would you recommend sort of National Archives, Pennsylvania Archives or? The National Archives is the single best way to do it. And what you do is you, I could, we could talk later on the phone, but there's a way to um, get their pension application form or probably be the widow pension if they had widows. Um, well, all right. all right, that's one thing. Now that I'm saying they were killed in battle, there wouldn't be a pension unless the widow sought one. And then you could go and see what they testified. There would be an affidavit and would go into their detailed case. That was gold mine for this kind of research for men who were still alive. Get their regimental histories and often regiments right around 19, 1890, 1900, 1910, there was a whole burst of regimental histories as these men were getting older and you know, dying off. They wanted to record everything fresh. So they would designate somebody to write a very detailed, very um, glowing and, and, and those regimental reside, history. And those and, reside at Na National Archives? A lot of them are online. No, try them online. Okay. You, you literally can get a lot of them. I was able to get a lot of them online. They've been digitized. And those will take you through exactly month by month what the men did. And you might find your guy named in there. You might find a picture of them too. Some of these had whole galleries of pictures of the soldiers. That's where that drummer boy is from that. Um, and, that and the source. syphilis stuff was there too? <laughs> no. <laughs> syphilis stuff was in the, the medical uh, ledger. Yeah, no, that would not be uh, crowed about. <laughs> Thank you. Besides their pension, was there any? If you'd like, yeah. I'm sorry. Besides their pension, was there any post government to support, such as today we have the VA hospital and that sort of thing? Well, there was a, there would be old soldiers' homes. Dayton had a really big one, and some of the men from here ended up later in life out there, and that was government ran that. So I shouldn't say no, but there wasn't a VA per se. It was a, a home where the men could go and live um, very sparse kind of barracks setting. And there was, a, again, there was a big one in Dayton, Ohio. That's the biggest one that I know of. My question goes to the very first slide. Yeah. Where the recruitment slide, it said, I believe $290 bounty. Yeah. What exactly did that mean, bounty? You know, somebody maybe in the room here knows better than I, because that really wasn't the scope of what I was researching. But it would be, you know, a sign up. You know, and, and they'd figure out at the end if you had been paid it or not, or if you would get it at the end. OK. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't want to make up an answer here. I don't know exactly how, and there were bonuses and there were bounties and I, it's something I didn't research because it didn't pertain. So I'm sorry, that's a good question. Maybe somebody else knows who's right here. You guys are Civil War Roundtable, right? I'm really, I'm just being honest, yeah. I don't know the answer, but how many equivalent camp discharges were there? Yes, you know, along in the Northeast, I, you pick you pick the the metric, but right seems like we probably weren't the only one. You would think not. The best I and I've been asked that before, and it doesn't come right out as like, okay, here's a network of them, and there was this one and this one and this one. You would think there would. This was the only one called camp discharge, by the way. Discharges mean something in the army, and there were not every 
state didn't have a camp discharge. This was it for camp discharge. The best I can tell, there was a Western, remember I mentioned this was Eastern PA. There was a Western PA military jurisdiction. And the only references I see is that soldiers in the, the same situation would be funneled to Harrisburg, maybe to Camp Curtin, I don't know. And maybe there was another camp. Again, this is, I didn't, if I found it out, I would have probably stuck it in there, but it really wasn't what I needed to know to write this book, but I, it, I've wondered that too. What I can tell you is from references that I've seen, and there isn't a whole lot in there, I mean, references, was there was a um, adjutant's office where the men could go um, in Harrisburg, there was one in Carlisle, there was one in Pittsburgh. You might think the camp, if there was a camp discharge kind of camp would be in Pittsburgh, but it seems to have been in Harrisburg and that served the Western regiments as best I can tell. I don't know what it was called. I don't know how big it was, but that's, that's the best answer I can give. In terms of other states, I don't know. They might've had a different system that nobody's written about all this. I was only only able to find a, a good doctoral thesis paper about the demobilizing of the Union Army. You know, it, it's just skipped over. And it was a huge operation. They, you know, there was a million men in the Union Army. There, 800,000 were let go by the end, you know, in 1865. I mean, that's massive. And you, you hear all about, you know, the, the um, recruiting and the growth you know, early in the war, but the, the contraction isn't really, hasn't been studied, at least I couldn't find it. So I, all of which is to say, I'm not sure. And it didn't jump out at me. And I was surprised that it did not. But again, I, what I got in here is accurate and it's what it is. <laughs> it's something, you know, every, so much is known about civil war, isn't it odd that the, that's the case, but it's, it seems to be the case. I didn't find anything in Carlisle about it either. That's a lot of money, yeah. It's a lot of money. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't have that slide because it makes you wonder about that. And that's not really the point of the slide. It was more. The, the rush to enlist in 61 and the enthusiasm, you know, back then. Um, but I'm going to go look that up because I'll probably get it. I should know it. <laughs> this is, by the way, my, our first, my first public talk about this book. So thank you for your questions. Yeah. I know we all learned something from Jim tonight and he will be back at the table with his books. Um, so I know you'll be happy to answer questions there. I just wanted to remind you about our upcoming programs. Uh, next week's program, which is our uh, Liberty Series program with General Jack Keen is sold out with a wait list. Uh, that program will not be um, on Zoom. So if you are lucky enough to have a seat, we look forward to seeing you. If you are lucky enough to have a seat and cannot come, please let us know so that we can give that seat to someone else. Monday, October 4th, there is a public affairs program, A Republic, Not a Democracy with Adam Brandon. That is at 6 p.m. Wednesday, October 13th, we have a library hour, the artist behind Douglas with Jordan Sokol, who is the artist of our new portrait. And then Wednesday, October 27th, our next Civil War, Civil War Roundtable is Lee, a biography with Alan Gelzo. And that one is sure to sell out. So sign up for that one quickly. The last three I mentioned will also be on Zoom. So thank you for supporting us. If you don't support us, please do. And we 